that a little bit long, a little bit later on. But primarily, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now, it's very important that I give to you uh, what the people in Jesus' day believed about the resurrection, those who held that there is a resurrection. It's not the same belief that we have today, because we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have um, more information upon which we can build on that we've learned primarily from Jesus about what the resurrection is going to be like and also from the apostles such, such as Paul. But a common view of the resurrection in Jesus' day was this. It was the restoration of the natural body still with all its appetites and its passion. In other words, it was a low view of the resurrection or resurrected body. We have what I would call a high view of the resurrection body in that when Christ uh, resurrects our bodies, even though we have died, our spirit is with the Lord, uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Our spirit goes to the Lord, our soul, if you will. Uh, but the body uh, decays in, in the grave, okay? But a day is coming when our bodies are going to be restored, but not like they are now with the physical weaknesses, with the sin nature and all of that. No, it's going to be a glorified body like whom? Like Jesus' glorified body. And it is eternal. So that's the high view of the resurrection. So anyway, the Sadducees are coming to Jesus and they are going to challenge him. So I'm going to pick it up at verse 23 again and we're going to read down to verse 24 and I'm going to share some things there. Beginning of verse 23, the same day Sadducees came to Jesus who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked Jesus a question. We'll get the question at the very end. But they want to set it up. They have to set up their argument to Jesus. And what they do is they go to Scripture. That's the right thing to do. They're going to go to Scripture. So, in verse 24 it says, saying, um, so they, the, the Sadducees are saying to Jesus, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry, that's something that has to be done, must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, what scripture are they referring to? Well, I'm going to take you to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 25. I want you to see something in here. Here, Moses is towards the end of his life, and he gives them a teaching that's called the Leveret Law. You might want to write that down. Leveret Law, that's spelled L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E. The Leveret Law or the Leveret Marriage. And here is the very verse that they are referring to that Moses spoke. This is what they believe. This is, a, this is a scriptural verse that they believe and they're going to use it to undermine the, the uh, resurrection. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family uh, of, uh, to a stranger. In other words, they want to keep the name of that son uh, and his heritage uh, in, the, in line with the, the nation of Israel and of his particular tribe. Her husband's brother shall go in to her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. So the, the wife's husband has died. Uh, he's an Israelite, he's a Jew, they've had no children, and so there has to be uh, another son to carry on the heritage, and so 
Moses says this is how it's going to take place. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So the whole reason for this passage is for, uh, because Israel is God's nation, all right? And God wants to preserve them so as to not only preserve the man's name who died, but also to preserve his inheritance, the land that he owns. That is what this passage is all about. And then it goes on. If you look down at verse, um, towards the end of verse 7, I'm just going to uh, bring out what it says here. My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. And so Moses is giving a situation where uh, a man's brother died, the wife, his wife, the brother's wife, uh, goes to the next in line, the next oldest brother, to say, you need to be my redeemer, if you will. You need to marry me so that we can have children through you. And he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to have anything to do with this woman. And so she gets upset, rightfully so, because this is a law. So look at verse 8. So the guy doesn't want to marry this woman. And in verse 8 it says, Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him, and if he persists, in other words, they're trying to convince him, no, you need to marry this woman. That's what Moses teaches. Saying, I do not wish to take her. Then his brother's wife shall go up to him. Listen to this. You'll like this, women. I'll go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandals off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. How dare you? Now I want you to focus on verse 10 because we're going to see this again. Verse 10, and the name of his house, the one who refuses, shall be called in Israel the house of him who pulled, uh, who had his sandals pulled off. So that is what ratifies that decision not to marry your own uh, sister-in-law because your brother has died. Now, having said that, there is actually an account in Scripture where this worked out, and it worked out perfectly. So I want you to turn to the book of Ruth right now. So I'm laying down what it means to have a leveret marriage or the leveret law. Ruth chapter 3. I'm going to just focus on verse 2. And, uh, and many of you might know some things about... Um, about uh, Ruth, if you have read it and, uh, and studied it, and you kind of know the storyline about it. Let me just go through very quickly. The, the main people in the, in the book of Ruth is Emelech and Naomi. They're a husband and wife. Uh, they, uh, during a time of great famine in, in uh, Bethlehem, they went, they moved to Moab, where they stayed there. They had sons. That was Milan and Chilion. Uh, their sons, Milan and Chilion, married Moabite women. Not Jewish women, Moabite women. And their names were Orpah and Ruth. Now, Elimelech died. And later on, both of the sons died. So at this point, Naomi, the wife, and, and the, the girls, the, the, her daughter-in-laws, they have no heritage back home other than her Hers, her uh, husband's land, but that has to be redeemed because somebody else has it, so it has to be redeemed. So it goes on. Emelech died, the sons died, so Orpah went back to her people, to the Moabites. Ruth stayed with Naomi. She was faithful to Naomi, and so she, along with Naomi, went back to Bethlehem because the famine was over, so they went to restore their lives back in the Jewish nation, in the, in the tribe of Benjamin. And the closest kinsman and redeemer to Naomi was not Boaz that we saw just mentioned. 
It's not Boaz. It was another one who was the next in line to Naomi. He would have to be the redeemer. Okay? So we see that. And look at verse 12 with me in chapter 3 of Ruth. And now it is true. And this is Boaz that's speaking. And what has happened up to this point is Naomi, it, uh, she has been gleaning from Boaz's fields. And, uh, and Naomi said, he is one of our redeemers. Go and lay at his feet and see what the Lord does with that. And so this has happened, and in verse 12 it says, And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Boaz says, I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. There is someone closer to Naomi than myself, and we have to go to him first. That's what we see in chapter 4. I'm just going to go through it very quickly. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate, because that's where you do business, and sat down there, and behold the Redeemer, the next in line to Naomi, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, my friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. I'm going to jump down to verse 3. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech, her husband. Go down to the bottom of uh, verse 4. I'm going to pick it up if you can find it. If you will redeem it, redeem it. it redeem what? Redeem the land. But if you will not, tell me that I may know that there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And so Boaz says, I'm the next in line after you. If you're going to redeem it, redeem it. If you don't, uh, I will redeem it. And so the Redeemer says, I will redeem it. Now I want you to pick up on this because this is very interesting. Boaz goes on because I, I really think he likes Ruth. You know, I think he likes Ruth a lot. So Boaz says, the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth. In other words, you have to marry Ruth, the Moabite. And the, the, there's scripture about marrying outside of your family, outside of the Jewish family. The widow of the dead, in order per, to perpetuate the name of the dead, in other words, keep the name of the one who died, Elimelech, and his inheritance, the land. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. He's making an excuse. He just doesn't want to get married. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel, and we looked at that custom concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal. And why does he draw off his sandal? Because he does not want to marry Ruth. And gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders, because he has witnesses there, and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have brought, brought from, the land, from the hand of Naomi and all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and to Malion. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malion, of uh, Milan, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his people. Go back to our text in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be picking it up now at verse 25. So, this is the, the, that is the, that is the teaching, that is the references that the Sadducees are using to, to say that there is no resurrection. How do we know that? We're going to continue on now in verse 25. They gave the scriptural account in verse 24, but now at this point, it's no longer scripture they're going to use. They're fabricating their own story to make up what they see as a good argument for the reason that there is no 
resurrection. So looking at verse 25 down to verse 28. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. So too, the second married and died. The third married and died, down to the seventh. Verse 27, after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? That's the problem. There's been no lineage. There's been no children that have been born into this family. Whose wife will she be? In other words, the, the, the resurrection is ridiculous based upon what they know from the scriptures that there can be no resurrection. Whose wife? That's the question that they wanted to bring to Jesus. Whose wife will she be? Because there's been no children. For they all had her. So now we come to the second point. Jesus now is going to turn the table on the Sadducees by drawing their attention back to the scriptures exactly where he needs to take them. So he's going to turn them back to the scriptures and the power of the living God. That's the second point, the power of the living God in verses 29 through 32. And I love, I absolutely love how Jesus starts off this argument with the Sadducees. He says, you were wrong. And here, you can't beat the King James Version. You are ignorant. <laughs> that is perfect. It says it perfectly. You are ignorant. And they, what are they ignorant of? He tells them exactly what they are ignorant of. They're ignorant of the scriptures. And they're ignorant of the power of God. And, and the fact that they are ignorant of the scriptures, uh, they have denied all of the known canonical Old Testament. All they believe in is the first five books of the Bible. That means they reject all the historical books of the Bible that talks about the whole nation of Israel, its formation and everything else. It also, they deny the, uh, the wisdom books, Job through Songs of Solomon, they deny all that. They deny all the prophets, the, the major prophets and the minor prophets. So they don't have all the scriptures. They're ignorant of the scriptures. And so um, from there, even today, we have, we have churches that see no need for the Old Testament. All you need to know is what is in the New Testament. All you need to know is about the resurrection. All you need to know is about Jesus. No. The Old Testament is the Word of God. And it is profitable for doctrine and for teaching and reproof for correction. It is the Old Testament that sheds light and gives understanding to the New Testament. And the New Testament... Uh, looks back and gives understanding to what was going on in the Old Testament that they did not understand at that time because of God's progressive revelation. And the revelation is now complete because we have both the New and the Old Testament. But we need both. But yet churches are denying any need for the Old Testament. This is God's progressive revelation. And so not only they are ignorant in the Word of God, the Scriptures, but they are ignorant in God's power. They, for some reason, the Sadducees believe that it is impossible for God to take what is dead and bring it back to life. No, that, that just can't happen. What about creation? What about the, the worldwide flood? What about the exodus itself? And all that God did, all the miracles that God did through the Exodus and the very books that they say they believe. But they refuse to believe it. There are no miracles. Those things don't happen. So they're rejecting all this. So, so Jesus is saying to them that you are ignorant. So Jesus now, in verse 30, provides divine correction. Look at verse 30 with me. 
For in the resurrection, now Jesus is going to start saying something about the resurrection. Notice that he's not denying the resurrection at all. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So in his divine correction, he's, regarding, he's going to be saying something about marriage, and he's also going to say something about angels. Let's look at marriage just for a second. In the resurrection, marriage no longer is necessary. Why? Because we're going to have mortal, glorified bodies. All that are going to be redeemed will be redeemed. That is why in Genesis... God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In the resurrection, we, don't long, we no longer have to fill the earth. God has done everything he needs to do. In other words, um, the, the, the uh, marriage is to be a part of creating the family environment, bringing stability in a, in a sin-cursed world where children are nurtured and raised up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, the carry on uh, a believing re, uh, uh, generation that turns to the Lord in faith. But then also, uh, we, you know, we see from Ephesians that we have a responsibility, but that won't be necessary in the resurrection when we are in glory with the Lord. Now, some are really bothered by this. There might be some people here today, and I'm going to pick on uh, Eli and Sierra because they're going to get married very soon. But what if the Lord happened today and they didn't get married? Oh, I never got a chance to get married. Oh, my goodness. You know, so people look at this, this verse where Jesus talks about in the resurrection there will be no marriage, and they think, oh, what happens if, if Christ comes today and I, I don't ever have that opportunity to get married? That would be fine. <laughs> Chad, I'm getting to you right now. Because there are others that would be very comforted by this truth. <laughs> that there is no marriage in heaven. But let me, let me share something with you. Let me give you some solace in you too, Chad, about this. All our earthly relationships, friends and families, those who know the Lord, and will be in glory forever with the Lord. Those relationships will be far more fulfilling, far more rewarding in glory than you will ever experience in this life. Amen. So Jesus talks about marriage, but then he turns their attention to angels. What do Sadducees not believe? They don't believe in angels. So Jesus, by saying what he says, he doesn't even deny the angels. He says, but are like. Those in the resurrection are like angels. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I've already explained it to the kids. That doesn't mean that when we die, we will be angels with wings. What that means is that we will be deathless like the angels. We will be immortal like the angels because when we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have eternal life. And though this physical body will die, it will be glorified again un, unto like the Lord's. And so now it goes on in verse 31. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, obviously not, have you not read what, said, what was said to you by God? He's going back to the scriptures. And where he goes back to is in, um, is in Genesis uh, chapter, let me see if I have it down. I don't know if I wrote it down here. But he is going back to, uh, to Genesis. Uh, let me see. No, it's in Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. Let's turn there real quick. Exodus Chapter 3, I'm running a little bit long, but I will close up here very quickly. Exodus, uh, thin pages are hard to get through. Exodus chapter 3, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 1. You'll, you'll know the story here, the burning bush. 
Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, and the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. That is the pre-incarnate. What I take is the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord. Uh, uh, met with him in the flame of fire in the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside uh, to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off. Here's sandals again coming off. Sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Why? Because God is there. Verse 6. And he said, I am, pick up on that, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Let's go back to our text. This is exactly where Jesus takes the Sadducees to. And what is interesting is that Jesus is using the very scriptures they say they believe. So he's using what they know to be true to point out the argument that he is making that the resurrection is real. And you need to accept it. And so, here we pick it up in verse 32, where Jesus uses that text that I just read to you, where God says, I am. I want you to notice, first of all, it's present tense. It's present tense. I am the God of Abraham. If Abraham, if Isaac and Jacob were dead, he would have had to say, I was. That is the difference. He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. What Jesus is telling them is that Abraham is still alive. They haven't realized the resurrection yet. That would be yet future for Abraham. It's past in our day because the first resurrection is Jesus Christ. And all of us will follow like him. But Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are looking for it that day, but they are very much alive in a place that I would call paradise. And so Jesus says he is not God of the dead, but of the living. He is just proving from Scripture and the Scriptures that they hold to and believe in that the resurrection is real. And what happens? Verse 33 in our conclusion, and when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Every single leader has tried to thwart Jesus, but it hasn't happened, and it won't, because Jesus is God, and he knows the truth, and he knows everything perfectly. The crowds were astonished at Jesus' teaching. The Sadducees were silenced, and we'll see that next week. Let me just share a couple things, and then we'll, I'll close in prayer. One, God is not God of the dead, but of the living. So God is God of the living, and it refers to the eventual resurrection of all those who have turned their life to Christ, or who, who, who were even before they even knew about Christ, turned to God in faith. But I want you to pick up on something else. God is not God of the dead. As long as a person is alive, God is God, and God is God over them. He is sovereign over them. But it also seems to indicate that once that person dies apart from God, they are, ever, they are forever removed from God. And that is a bad place to be. And that is eternal. It's not, not, ceasing, it's not ceasing to exist anymore. It is in a place of absolute abandonment and torture and fire and flame 
hell and brimstone and everything else that you can add to it. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, please turn to Him today. If you have any questions, please ask me. I'll be glad to share with you the truth of God's Word, the truth of God's love for you. God is holy. He is just. He is loving. But He must and will and has punished sin. But He has punished His Son who lived a perfect life so that all who believe in Jesus, His Son, do not have to die in their sins, but can have eternal life because it is forgiven because your faith is in Christ, His, His beloved Son. So when God's Word, as we see from this passage today, is faithfully taught, when it is faithfully studied, when it is faithfully preached does three things. It dispels ignorance. It corrects wrong interpretation. And it restores faith in God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we glorify your name. Jesus, we thank you so much for teaching truth to the Sadducees. Pray that we would have ears uh, to hear and eyes to see your glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.